Well, today we'll finish up our uh, study or our series that we've been doing on parables. And um, as we've been talking about parables, we've talked about how many of them we've heard over and over and over again. We've heard them so many times. But they always have a really good story. They always have a great meaning. They always have something that I think that we can always add into our life. And today I want to do one of, it's actually one of my favorite parables. And it's, uh, it's one that has been taught many, many times. Uh, matter of fact, we did it, uh, I, I preached this same parable. Uh, I think I preached it out of Matthew, though, the last time. And that was back in, uh, back three years ago when we were doing a series on the harvest here in the fall. But uh, there's always something else, something new, something uh, that we can glean from each one of these passages. And we look at it from a little bit different, uh, different way. Now, if you've been here more than once or twice, you have already figured out that I love evangelism. That I believe in evangelism. And I'm, I believe in the importance of evangelism. I, I understand and I recognize how important it is and how we are called as Christians to evangelize the world. Uh, that it's our job. I mean, that's the only reason that God leaves us here. Once we, once we become a Christian, once we get saved, the only reason He don't take us on at that point, the only reason He don't take us to heaven from that moment is so that we can stay here and win more to Christ. So that we can stay and share the gospel. So that we can tell more and we can bring more. But along with evangelism, I also believe in the importance of discipleship. I believe that as a Christian, we are also to be a disciple. And you cannot be a disciple, you cannot classify yourself or call yourself a disciple if you're not making more disciples. That's, that's what it means to be a disciple, that we are so close to Christ that we are His follower and we do the things that He did. I, uh, I have learned that the term Christian is used way too much and too liberally and in, in a way that it's lost a lot of its meaning. Uh, people don't look at Christian as the, as, a, uh, as the term that it really means to be Christ-like. But disciple is something that you can't, uh, it, it's not used in a way that uh, loses its meaning. When we are a disciple of Christ, we are a follower, a close follower follower of Christ. So therefore I believe in evangelism. I believe in uh, discipleship. Now one thing that I learned over the years is, is uh, a lot of times in disciple or in evangelism it's real easy to start feeling like a failure. It's real easy to feel like you're not getting the job done. It's real easy to feel like, and as a, as a pastor, it's easy to feel that way too. It's real easy to, to get the feeling that I'm not doing my job. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing something right. I'm not seeing results. And therefore, that something is, is failing. And it's easy to get discouraged. Now, the thing is, this parable we're going to look at today is one that Jesus tells us, and it, it is it has several purposes. Number one, I think I think that the reason that He gives us this parable today that we're going to go over today is that He gives it to us for an encouragement, so that we understand that a lot of people we share with, a lot of people we witness to, a lot of people we reach out to are not going to come to know Him. He gives us that to encourage us. So that we don't, so that we don't get discouraged and say we're failing, we're not doing a, we're not doing a good job. He he lets us know that it's our job to keep spreading the word. It's not our job to draw them. It's not our job to win them. It's not our job to save them. It's our job to spread the word. And there will be many that do not come to know the Lord. I think also in this in this parable, he gives us a. Uh, a way to see better results for our efforts. So today we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 and we're going to be talking about sowing the seed. And once again, as we've talked about before, a lot of Jesus' parables have to do with agriculture. And the reason is, is that 
at that time, uh, everybody was familiar with agriculture. Um, nobody back then had the idea that you just went to the grocery store and there was food. They, they didn't believe that. I, I told y'all once before I saw a post that somebody had, had was, was sharing around laughing at because somebody said, I don't understand why we need farmers. Just go to the grocery store and get your food. Uh, you know, but back in those days, people understood where the food came from. They may not have all been farmers, but they understood at the marketplaces where that food came from. And uh, so therefore, when Jesus talked, he talked a lot of his parables were related to agriculture or to farming. And uh, today, they it seems like today we have to, to explain it more than he did back in those days. But in Mark chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1, it says, And again he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and set it into the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as, the, as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth, but when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, or choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seeds fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and, pro and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take this word and let it be an encouragement to us to continue the good work. Continue to spread the gospel to the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, the first thing I see here is he's talking about sowing. And I literally had youth one time when I started this and I talked about a sower who went out to sow. They had no clue. They thought I was talking about a tailor. They thought I was talking about somebody that sewed with a needle and thread. They had no idea what it meant to sow. Now, back in, like I said, back in Jesus' day, everybody knew what it meant to sow. But today, people, a lot of people don't understand what it even means to sow. And uh, to sow, uh, is a way of planting seeds. And this is something that I hope everybody here understands that, but if not, we're going to explain it to you. Uh, it is not, he's not talking about taking a needle and thread and running it through a bunch of seeds, okay? That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is a way that we, that you spread seed over a large area. And and the way that you would do that, now I've got, uh, there's several ways of doing it today. Uh, if you are planting, if you're sowing grass seed, if you're planting wheat, if you're planting barley, if you're planting uh, any kind of small grain, this is how you would do it. Now you would also, uh, in, in today's time, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you're planting tomatoes, if you're planting tobacco, if you're planting uh lettuce, if you're a lot of different plants, peppers, uh, you would sow your seeds. Now I know everybody says, well wait a minute, wait a minute, tomatoes are out here one plant in a row, or your tobacco, I see it in rows. That's true. But with those kind of plants, what you would do is you would prepare a bed. And that bed, you would get that, that ground absolutely perfect. You would take it and you would kill everything that's in it. You would uh, Back in the old days, you'd plant, you'd build a fire over it and burn everything out. But then, in the later days, you would take and, and you would actually put plastic down and and gas it and kill anything that's in it. And then you would sow those seeds. And then after they came up, those those tomatoes, those peppers, those tobacco plants, after they came up so big, you would take them and you'd pull them out of the ground and take them and replant them. 
But with, with small grain, and I believe this is what Jesus is talking about here, is the small grain, the rye, the barley, the oats, the wheat. These are things that you would, you would spread over a big field. And you would take a handful of seeds, and, and one handful of seeds would sow an acre. Uh, that would be enough to sow a, a huge field. And you would, you would take that, and you would mix it with, uh, when we would do grass seed, we'd take, a, uh, take grass seed and mix it with, with fertilize, and that way you could, you'd have a bigger uh, portion to spread out over that area. Back then, they would probably mix it with some fine dirt or something, and then they would sow it. And, you, and sowing it is spreading it. Now, we did it a lot of times by hand, but we also had a thing called a, a cyclone cedar. And uh, many of you know what that is, but it's a little thing you wear around your neck. It's got a big bag on it, and you start spinning it, and it, like the salt trucks, it spreads it out. Now, today, if you're doing a large field, the way you would spread it is you would uh, put it in a seed spreader on the back of your tractor. They didn't have those back then. But they would take these seeds and they would spread them out. And that's called sowing. And you would just scatter it and try to get it as even as you could. Now Jesus tells us here about four different kinds of soil that this rock or that this seed fell on. Now I'm going to tell you something that may surprise you. But nobody tries to sow seed in three of these kind of soils. Only a fool would try to sow seed in those three kinds of soils. The seed that is rocky, or the, the, uh, the, the hard packed ground, uh, the, that, that, is, that which is stony, which has very little dirt in it, or that is among the thorns. That is something that as you're scattering the seed in the good soil, what happens is you'll get some overcast. You'll get some that the wind will catch. You'll get some that, that goes in a direction that you don't want it to. When you take and you throw a bunch of seed this way, some of it's going to go over here where you don't want it to go. And But here's what's happening is, is this seed that he's talking about, when you let seed, if you're out here and you sow seed on a, on a pathway that the people have walked on, and that... that that soil has not been tilled, it's not been, not been disked, it's not been, been plowed up or anything, then that seed's just going to lay and it's going to hit just like laying it on this, on this uh, pulpit or on a piece of wood and it's just going to lay there and it's never going to take root. And it's going to, and, and along it's going to come a bird or come some animal and it's going to eat that seed or it's just going to rot there and that seed will turn to nothing. And then he says you're going to have some that's going to fall on this, on this uh, rocky or stony ground. Now this reminds me about my grandmother who told us, told us about uh, years ago, her and, and my grandfather, right after they got married, they decided they were going to move from here and they were going to go down on the Cumberland Plateau and, and they were going to uh, share crop down there. They found out that the soil was only about four inches deep, and they couldn't grow anything. And uh, this was back during the Depression at, at that too. This was back in about 30 when this happened. And uh, she told me that she had to sell eggs for a week in order to get enough money to buy a stamp to send a letter home to her daddy to come down and get it. And, uh, I said, well, well, how much was a stamp? She said, two cents. And, uh, you know, we don't know hard times. But, uh, but that's, what, that, that's what it reminds me of. That soil was so, so shallow that it was just rock underneath. And, and the thing is, is when you sow seeds or you plant something in that soil, it looks rich. It feels rich. It looks like good soil. And that it will start to grow. But you get the first little bit of sun on it. There's no depth to those roots. Those roots can't get down to the water supply. Those roots can't do anything, and therefore they, they wither and die. And then you, get, then you get the seeds that are sowed among the thorns or among other weeds. Around here we don't see that many thorns, but if it gets in the weeds, the weeds are going to choke it out. I remember growing up, as a, and that's why I hate farming. I, I never did like the thorn. Because my grandpa did things the old way. He didn't, he didn't spray stuff. Ever, it seemed like that's all we ever did was chop out weeds. And we did it constantly. 
And uh, that's why I hate farming. I, I, I hate chopping weeds. <laughs> but if you don't chop the weeds and you don't get the weeds out or you don't keep the seeds away from the weeds, what happens is, is they take all the nourishment. They take all that's, that's good in them and it actually chokes them out. And then you've got the good seed. And that's the seed. And you know you can take one seed, one seed, and you put it in good soil and that seed is going to grow and it's going to grow up into something that is usable. It's going to grow up and after it's pollinated and after it's nourished and after it receives the sun and receives the water and the fertilizer and all those things, it's going to grow up and it's going to produce a head of, of more seeds. And it's going to, there's going to be 30, 60 or 100 more seeds that that one seed is going to produce. And that's what Jesus was explaining to the people. That's the parable that he tells them. And you know what? They still didn't get it. Even though they were, they were uh, the, the people who were uh, understood uh, agriculture, they didn't get what he was telling them. As a matter of fact, this was one of his earlier or one of his first parables that we have recorded. In the middle of between him telling the parable and then him telling what the parable meant, he actually explains to them why he used parables. And he looks at his disciples and he says, now not everybody has the understanding that I have granted you. But even the disciples didn't get this. Now, when I read this parable, I understand it right off because I've heard it over and over and over again. But Jesus has to come along in verse 13 and explain to his disciples what he's talking about. Because they're sitting there thinking, well, why is he telling us about planting seeds? What does that have to do with anything? And I'm sure that's what they didn't understand. But then Jesus says to them, it says, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, here's what he's trying to get us to understand when he tells them this. Basically, all the parables I'm going to tell you, I want you to understand one thing. They're about me. They're about my Father. They're about the kingdom of heaven. Everything I'm going to tell you, everything that I'm going to do is going to point to the Father. And, yet, and when you understand that and you take every word that I say and you apply it to the Father or you apply it to the kingdom of heaven, you'll start to understand a little better. But he says, how are you going to understand any of the parables? But he says, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. Then likewise are the, other, are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arise, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of the riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Now, we look at this and Jesus makes it plain here. He's talking about the gospel. The seeds that are sown is the gospel. It's the word of God. It's the truth about Jesus. It's what we've learned about Jesus. Now, when he tells us this, I've heard people say that when you read this parable, that means a quarter of the people that you share the gospel with is all that's going to hear the word. No, that's not what he's saying here. Remember, when you sow seed, you plant most of it in the good ground. There's going to be some that falls away. But as I look at this and I read this and I see the ones, I remember when I was a kid, and I remember as I was a teenager, we would have visitation night. And we would get together and we would decide we're going to go out and we're going to visit. 
and we're going to go out and we're going to cold call it. We're just going to go knock on doors. And we're going to ask people, do you know Jesus as your Savior? We're going to ask people, if you died today, where would you go, heaven or hell? Let me tell you something. When you go visiting like that, you're going to find a lot of rocky ground. You're going to find a lot of hard, trampled ground. Because you're going to get the door shut in your face a whole lot. You're going to have people that's going to look at you and say, I don't want to hear it. And you're going to have a lot of people, and these are the ones that fall by the wayside. These are the, But listen, that's what, that's what I grew up with, and that's what I saw. And for that reason, I felt like for a long time that visitation was useless. I felt for a long time like it was just absolutely useless to go out visiting because we never saw many results from it. It seemed like all that we ever found was that hard-packed wayside. And, uh, and those seeds that we tried to sow, they just they didn't even take root. Don't, nobody would even listen. And I saw it more and more and more as growing up because that was the way that we were taught and that's the way that we, we, we tried to evangelize and it just never seemed to work very well. But that's the people he's talking about. And I think that everybody has tried to witness to somebody at some point. If you've ever tried to witness, and you've, you've witnessed to somebody, though, that just slammed the door in your face. Maybe not literally, but they just... I remember one guy that we were talking to, and this was somebody that was from the community. We all knew him. And, and, and I asked him one time, if you were to die today, where would you go? And he just looked at us and said, I'd split hell wide open. And he knew it. I had another man, and this was a this was a man that some of you I'm sure know. He was uh, he was the, the the one of the roads, not the road superintendent, but one of the road uh, the uh, supervisors for the county roads. He came down to the church one time, and me and him were standing in the parking lot talking. And I said, "Come on in, and look at things. Come in, come in. We just finished the church and." And he had put some rock on it. He did good things for the church. He came and rocked our gravel for our driveway for us. And, and I said, come on in and look at it. I ain't going in there. Let's fall down. I'll walk in. I mean, that was the kind of attitude that they had. And, and listen, this was the hard-packed soul. This is the people that are just really, really hard to reach. And that's the ones that Jesus is talking about. And I've, I've met many of those people in my life. And they are really, really hard to reach. They're really, really hard to, to witness to. Then he comes along and he says, then there's the kind that falls on the stony ground. And I've met my share of those too. Matter of fact, I've had a lot of those in my youth group over the years. And I remember we would go to a youth camp. We would go to a youth conference. We'd go to, to some big event, and I mean those kids would come back and they were on fire. They were so excited. And it was like they had just had a huge change in their life, and they're they're ready to, to as, as one, one preacher I heard one time, he said they were ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. I mean, they were, they were just on fire until Monday morning. And Monday morning, the fire went out. And, and, and I, I look back, and, and one of the things that used to bother me the most, though, was I'd always, we would come back from a camp, and, and, and the, the preacher would give us the service. We'd come back from our, say, youth conference, and we'd come back, and that Sunday night, we had all the youth come together, and they would testify, and you'd always have somebody say, well, I wonder how long that's going to last. They'd throw that wet blanket on them, and they'd put out the fire. And that used to bother me so bad, and it still does. And I, you know, they never gave them the encouragement that they needed. But yet, I understood that a lot of them, now not all of them, but there was a lot of them, that they would get excited, but that it was emotional. I think that a lot of what Jesus is talking about here is those people who get an emotional experience. They come in and they and they get excited about what just happened. They, they, they're emotional because a lot of their friends were emotional. They're, they're emotional or they, they come to church and, and, and I've seen them come in and they something is uh, something's bothering them in their life. Something they, They've got some struggle in their life out there in the world and they've come to church because they don't know where else to turn. And they come and they hear the gospel and they get all excited 
And then they walk back out the door and you never see them again. Those are the ones that fall on the stony ground. Let me tell you those first two. They're lost. Now I've heard a lot of people, they, they look at that number two and they think that there's somebody that got saved but then lost it. Now, there's a lot of denominations out there that believe that can happen. They believe that that number two are those people who come and get saved but then they, then they go out and back out of the world and they lose that salvation. Let me tell you something. There's no way you can lose that salvation. But there's a lot of people who never got the salvation. They came and they and they, they had an emotional experience. They got excited. They got, they, they got headed in the right direction for a moment, but they never surrendered. They never repented. They never truly gave their life to Jesus. Then that third group, we had... I had one come not too long back and I see I see that third group in her life. She came for a while looking for something. She came looking for something and she she I could tell by talking to her she needed something. She would come with her family in the morning and she'd come by herself at night and this happened for a few weeks. But the thing is and they never they, they want to reach out. They, they want to get what the church has got. They want to get involved a little bit, but they never want to let go of the world. So many people do this. We see it so many times that people, that they know they need the church. They know they need Jesus. They know they need Christ in their life, but, but I am, I am I'm rooted in the world. And I want to hold on to my old friends and I want to hold on to my old habits and I want to hold on to the things that I've got, got going on over here and I, and I like these things more than I want this. And we see it all the time. And these are the ones that Jesus is talking about who come and they that you, you see them and you, you know that they want what's going on. You know that they want to be a part and they, they, they want to get rooted but yet they never want to let go of the world and eventually the things of the world, if they don't let go of what's in the world and they never surrender to Jesus and they want to hold on to their old lifestyle, they'll never take root. They'll never be fruitful. The thing is, those are lost too. Some people looked at that, and I've heard people look at it and say, well, these are they, they, they got it. They just couldn't separate themselves. Let me tell you something. Jesus said they were unfruitful. They never produced. We're told that we will be known by our fruits. And if you're not producing fruits, it's a good chance you're not truly rooted in Jesus. Because if he, if we are rooted in Jesus and we become His disciple and we are His disciple, we can't help but to make more disciples. I see so many people that, that claim to be Christians, that claim to be a disciple of Jesus, but yet they never go out, they never share the gospel, they never produce more fruit. Jesus said, when you get it, when, you, when, when your world, or when you have, when you have taken root, and you, you root yourself into Jesus. These are the ones that are the good ground. When you root yourself into Him, you're going to grow. You're going to start to produce fruit. And that's what we are to do. You see, it's not about getting excited. Even though I think when you truly get what Jesus has got, you will get excited. But just getting excited don't get you saved. It's not about getting excited. It's not about getting emotional. It's not about walking the aisle. It's not about making a profession. It's not about getting baptized. It's about surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you'll be a, there'll be a change. There'll be a repentance. Jesus said you must be born again. That means taking on a whole new life. Letting go of the world. You see, these three, the three souls that he talked about, they're all still lost. And we all know somebody like that that fits into one of those categories. There are people that go to this church. There's people on the membership role of this church. 
that fit into those three categories. There are those that 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 we don't see. They they come and they when they need something. They come when they they come when they uh, things are going rough. They they come when they when they're getting down. But yet you never see them any other time. They're not a part. They're not. They've never truly surrendered to the Lord. You see, we see those three kinds. Here's the thing that I see, though, that Jesus is telling us in this. Number one, don't get discouraged. Jesus had many, many, many people. Do you know that the scribes and the Pharisees followed him everywhere he went? There are some of the Pharisees, some of the very people that stood and yelled, crucified him, heard every sermon that he preached. They listened to every word that he said. And if they listened to him for three years and they heard all of his sermons, and they don't be discouraged if you go out here in the world and you tell people about him and they don't listen to you either. Because a lot of them didn't listen to him. So that's the first thing I see in this is not to let yourself get discouraged because we're not seeing the fruits right off. But here's the next thing I see. Sowing seeds on bad ground don't make sense. In other words, you know, when I, when I was growing up, we, uh, we built some houses and we built some, uh, some different things. And, and I sowed a lot of grass. I remember when we built, built a, uh, the gas station we, it was there was a bank behind that gas station. It was so steep, and me and my brother, I was about 13 years old at that time, and we raked that ground, and then it was old red clay, but we raked it and we 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 tilled it up, and we worked on that, and we sowed it, and we had people come and they say, "You'll never get grass to grow on that." And let me tell you, it, it grew like crazy. Do you know why? We put a lot of work into tilling that soil. I you can you can grow. You can grow on about anything if you work the soil and you put the nutrients into it and you do the things to loosen it up. And I've learned that a long time ago and, there, and for that reason what I see here is when we go out to sow the seed of the gospel, when we go out to sow the word as Jesus tells us to do, we need to till the soil. We need to, to till the soil. And that's why we don't we didn't go over here in the neighborhood cold calling and asking people if they knew Jesus as their Savior. <laughs> we went over there and gave them a gift basket. <clears throat> we went over there and told them that Jesus loved them. We went over there and invited them to a cookout. You see, we gotta we gotta loosen things up. We gotta loosen the soil up. We gotta we gotta let people know why we're here. We gotta let people know. And it's not about a country club. It's not about getting numbers. It's not about just inviting people to church. Because if what we were doing was about lifting up Greenwood Baptist or getting people in Greenwood Baptist, then we're wasting our time. It's about loosening up the soil and it's about tilling the soil so that they will hear and they will understand about Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's why we had our cookout last night. Not just so that we could, we could uh, have food together, but it was about letting all the people of our community, and we had a lot of them from the community come out, but it was about letting the community know that we loved them because Jesus loved them. Let me tell you something. They may not all be here this morning, but we've got an audience with them now that we didn't have before. They're more likely to listen to us now than they were before. Now, as you all know, I post every one of our sermons on Facebook, on YouTube, on our website. And just by having this cookout and inviting people to this cookout, we have about... 15 more people this week who have liked our Facebook page that have a better chance of hearing this message today than they did before. I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying it'll make a difference in their life. But let me tell you something. We're tilling the soil. 
we're preparing the soul. We're preparing people's hearts. And see, that's the soul is talking about is their hearts. Folks, as we go out and we, we spread the word, we tell people about Jesus, we got to let them know. We got to soften things up. We got to we got to share in a way that they know it's about love. That's our goal. That's our job. And this this parable has such an importance about telling us to prepare the soul. This morning, as we as we come to the end, we first of all start with this: What soul were you? What soul are you? There may be some here this morning who, who maybe had an emotional experience. Maybe they, maybe they've, uh, maybe they made a profession. Maybe they've been, even been baptized, but they never let go of the world. Maybe there's somebody here that's just having the world choke them out. Maybe there, maybe there's somebody here that's just having a really, really hard time feeling rooted in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you just, have, maybe you're just struggling with that fruitfulness. Whatever it is, let me invite you this morning to come and make it right. Come and, come and give it over to the Lord. Come and surrender it to Him. But if you're here this morning and, and, and you know that you are a Christian, you know that you're a disciple, that here's your, here's your challenge. Go make more disciples. Don't get discouraged because you failed in the past. They didn't reject you. They rejected Christ. Go out and continue to spread the word. But look at the way you spread it. Look at where you spread it. And fear, think, how can I till that soil? How can I soften that heart? How can I show the love of Jesus to the people I need? Then we got the task of tending the soil. Once they take root, we, we can't let the world choke them out. We can't let that. That's, our, that's part of our job as well, is to keep them growing and keep fertilizing. Folks, whatever it is you need this morning, wherever you feel that God is calling you, if you'll just come this morning. As Ethan and, and the musicians come this morning, let us stand and let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you, uh, that you still call people. We thank you, Lord, that you still give us the opportunity to know you and that you give us the opportunity, Lord, to tell people about you. And I pray, Lord, this morning that you will just help us. Help us to just have a new goal to spread your word. In your name we pray.